Imagine that a football is rolling down the road toward you. Is it going to be very difficult to stop that football? The answer probably is no. Let's imagine a different scenario though. This time, there's a truck coming toward you. Would you be keen to hop in its path and try and slow it down? You probably answered no to that second question as well. These two responses lead us to an even more important question though. Why? What's the difference between the ball and the truck? The answer is momentum. You've heard of momentum before. Even better, in fact, is that you've seen momentum before. Any object that's moving is going to have some momentum. If it helps, think of momentum as the oomph that an object has. Just don't write that during your exam. We can measure momentum with this simple little equation. P equals mv. That P, for some reason, is the symbol for momentum. On the right, we have the mass of the object measured in kilograms and the velocity measured in meters per second, of course. Because these two things are multiplied together, the unit of momentum is simply kilogram meters per second. Let's use this equation to work out some momentums. We'll assume that both the ball and the truck are traveling at 10 meters per second. We'll say that the ball weighs 0.5 kilograms and the truck weighs 1,000 kilograms. Here are the momentums for each of these objects. The ball will just be 0.5 times 10, which will be 5 kilogram meters per second. The truck, though, will be 1,000 times 10, so it'll be 10,000 kilogram meters per second. Those numbers probably help explain why it's a better idea to not jump in the middle of a truck's path. We're now going to take a look at what happens when two objects that both have their own momentum run into each other. Whenever this happens, it's called a collision. Collisions are an important part of your mechanics studies. They can seem horrible and complex, but there happens to be an amazing little rule that you can use to simplify even the worst looking questions. It's called the conservation of momentum, and it's the best friend you'll ever have. Well, well maybe. It works like this. The total momentum before the collision equals the total momentum after the collision. So why don't we check out an example? Let's say that you've gotten sick of soccer balls and trucks, and so you take some time off to play a bit of pool. On one particular shot, you hit the white ball, which weighs 0.2 kilograms, into the blue ball, which weighs 0.15 kilograms. The white ball is hit at a velocity of 6 meters per second. The two balls collide, and the blue ball ends up traveling at 4 meters per second to the right. What will the final velocity of the white ball be after the collision? This question looks daunting, but it's actually super easy. We can view the momentums as vectors because they involve velocity. Vectors mean we need to choose an appropriate axis. So we'll make the right direction the positive direction and left the negative direction. We use that conservation of momentum equation to make the total momentum before and after the collision equal to each other. What is the total initial momentum of both balls going to be? Since the blue ball isn't moving, we can ignore it because it won't have any momentum. So all we're looking at is the white ball. We use the equation P equals MV and we end up with 1.2 kilogram meters per second. Great, now here's what the situation looks like after the collision. As you can see, both of the balls are now moving. To make things worse, we don't know what the velocity of the white ball is. However, that doesn't stop us from giving the total final momentum a go. For the white ball, the momentum will just be 0.2 kilograms times some velocity. For the blue ball though, the momentum will be 0.6 kilogram meters per second. So we can write that all out for the entire equation. 1.2 equals 0.6 plus 0.2 times v. This is just a simple piece of algebra. Solving for the final velocity of the white ball, we subtract 0.6 from both sides. So 0.6 now equals 0.2v. Then we divide both sides by 0.2, so that v equals 3. Therefore, we can say that the final velocity of the white ball will be 3 meters per second. And because it's a positive velocity, we can say it'll be moving to the right in the positive direction. So a mass with velocity has momentum. What about when a mass accelerates, as in its velocity changes? Doesn't this mean its momentum changes too? In physics, the change in momentum is called impulse, and it's written as 
delta p, as in a change in momentum. Delta p equals f delta t. It's equal to the force involved multiplied by the change in time. Basically, the faster something can slow down or speed up, as in change its momentum, the more impulse it has. So why did we bother talking to you about forces? Well, because the impulse of an object will always be proportional to the force that was needed to speed it up or slow it down. So the faster you were able to stop the truck, the more force you would have to push on the truck with. We can arrange the equation for impulse in terms of force. F equals delta P over delta T. So as soon as we know how much momentum was gained or lost, and how much time the whole thing took to happen, we can figure out how much force was involved. We often see impulse and collisions. Take the example of the fun sport of high jump. Once you've jumped over the pole, hopefully, you land on a soft mat, right? The reason that mat is there is to slow down your change in momentum. You start out falling, and you end up with no momentum at all. The longer this can take, the less force your body has to deal with and the safer it is. Let's say you clear the bar and you're falling at 4 meters per second, and that you have a mass of 60 kilos. Therefore your momentum will be 240 kilogram meters per second. Now say that we know the collision with the mat takes 3 seconds to finish. What will the force be that was exerted on you? All we need to do is stick these numbers into the equation. If f equals delta p over t, then f equals 240 over 3 which is 80 newtons. Here's a side note. An elastic collision is one where momentum and kinetic energy are both conserved. So in other words, no energy is lost through friction. In an inelastic collision, some energy is lost to the outside world as friction, heat and sound, etc. But momentum is still conserved. One question that the examiners might ask you is about how the F equals delta P over T equation can be used to make car crashes or other collisions safer for any people involved. This sounds pretty scary, but it's straightforward as long as you remember that a lower force equals less chance of injury. To make the force lower, we can decrease the impulse, or more easily, increase the collision time. Look at the equation. A longer time will result in a lower force. So how can we increase the collision time? One way is through the use of crumple zones or other areas on a car which compress on impact, making the collision take place over a longer period of time, and decreasing the force. Remember, momentum is a vector and involves the mass of an object and its velocity. In a collision, the total momentum of the two objects before the collision is the same as after the collision. This is the conservation of momentum. Impulse is the change of momentum, and is equal to the force involved multiplied by a change in time. 